Hello and welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I want to talk about ophiolites and Bowen's reaction series. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is ophiolites, what they represent in terms of rock sequences and how they form. And then I want to talk about Bowen's reaction series. There's a continuous series and there's a discontinuous series, and I'll explain what that means. And then I'll show you some textural evidence for how Bowen's reaction series works. So at the end of this lecture, I hope students will be able to describe what an ophiolite looks like and why we think it represents oceanic crust, then to define Bowen's reaction series, both the continuous and discontinuous sides, and to identify textural evidence for Bowen's reaction series in thin sections. Okay, let's start with ophiolites. Ophiolites are a suite of distinctive rocks. They have a particular stratigraphy to them. At the top are deep ocean sediments. These are largely cherts and mudstones, cherts, so silica, rich rocks. Then there are pillow lavas. Pillow lavas have these elongate forms, which when cut show these rounded shapes that reminded people of pillows. And then there below those are sheeted dikes. These are sheeted dikes. So it's just a series of basaltic dikes, one after the other, intruded into a sequence. Below those are gabbros. There can be several kilometers of, of gabbros. And at the bottom of that are ultramafic rocks. So these can be dunites, Hartsburgites, or Lairzolites. This is a rock classification scheme. Dunite is just a very olivine rich rock. Hartsburgites are olivine orthopyroxene rocks, and layers of lights are sort of intermediate olivine orthopyroxene clinopyroxene. These are commonly viewed as preserved oceanic crust. Here is a schematic cross section of what an ophiolite looks like, and you can see it doesn't have the sediments up here, but there would be sediments up here, pillow lavas, sheeted dikes, plutonic rocks, gabbros and then ultramafic rocks. They are thrust onto continental margins, and so they have a shear zone underneath them. The shear zone is often high temperature and metamorphoses the rocks underneath them, so it's called the metamorphic sole. So there's a metamorphic sole underneath this distinct sequence of rocks. These are commonly thought to represent the earliest form oceanic crust during initiation of spreading. And it's sort of a funny thing. Sometimes these form at the initiation of subduction. So subduction will actually cause the upper plate to spread a little bit. This will create oceanic crust, which is then compressed and thrown back up onto the continental margin. So it's a little kind of a strange thing, but it is thought to represent the spreading of crust and the formation of oceanic crust. Not all ophiolites are created equal. They can have different thicknesses of the pillow lavas and the sheeted dikes. The gabbros can have quite variable thicknesses. And then the ultramafic rocks can have different thicknesses as well. Every summer, I go visit the Trinity Alps, which is a big ophiolite sequence. But what you find there is that it's almost completely dominated by ultramafic rocks. There's very little gabbro and pillow lavas. There's a ton of ultramafic rock there. And like I said, this is underlain by this thrust contact. This is typically what you see. There's sheared peridotite at the bottom. And then there's a temperature gradient, higher temperature rocks towards the ophiolite sequence, and lower temperature rocks as you go downwards. So if we look at the velocity structure of oceanic crust, it can be separated out into different layers, a low velocity layer 2a, intermediate 2b, higher 2c, and then very high layer 3. And these are thought to correspond very broadly with the kinds of rocks that we see in ophiolites. So the lower velocity layers are these pillow basalts and sheeted dikes. So these are basaltic, higher velocities for the gabbros, highest velocities for the peridotites. OK, quick question. Which of the following rock sequences would be in the correct order for an ophiolite? Bottom to top. And the answer is this one, metamorphic sole. There'd be ultramafic rocks here, then gabbro, then sheeted dikes, then pillow basalts, and then oceanic sediments. OK, so at this point, 
I would hope that you would have a sense of what a typical ophiolite sequence looks like, and then to interpret what someone might report to see whether it's consistent with what we would expect for oceanic crust. Okay, let's talk about Bowen's reaction series. Bowen's reaction series is founded on the concept that during the crystallization of a magma, there is a specific sequence of minerals that forms. And it works in two different ways. As a melt crystallizes, there's a continuous change to the melt composition. And it does two different things. One feature is the composition of plagioclase. So the first plagioclase to form out of the liquid has very high calcium content. And as the liquid evolves in composition, the plagioclase becomes more and more and more sodium rich. So it goes from an anerthitic plagioclase to a more albitic plagioclase. That's the continuous side of Bowen's reaction series. But then it turns out there's a discontinuous side as well. For mafic magmas, the first crystal to form out of it is olivine. And as the liquid changes composition and becomes more silica rich, we start to see more and more and more silica rich minerals. So we go from olivine to pyroxene, single chain silicate, amphibole, double chain silicate, biotite, sheet silicate, and then we start getting these tectosilicates down here. So there's the continuous side, which is plagioclase composition, and then there's the discontinuous side, which goes from olivine basically down to quartz and reflects changes in the content of silica in the magma. So here, just to show you again, discontinuous side, olivine, orthosilicate, island silicate, pyroxene single chain, amphibole double chain, biotite, sheet silicate. These are tectosilicates, muscovite also a sheet silicate. Here are some examples of the continuous series. So this is plagioclase composition. So these are crystals that are broadly zoned from a more calcic plagioclase for the early formed crystal core to more sodic plagioclase as we go out to the crystal rim. So here, for example, is a strongly zoned plagioclase crystal. Here's another one. You can see these oscillations. These occur too. So the plagioclase composition doesn't shift uniformly towards a more albitic composition. It, it goes up and down a little bit as we go along the way. But in general, if you look at a plagioclase like this one, in the core of the plagioclase, this orange material, it has anorthite contents that are about 50%. And as we go out towards the rim, these anorthite contents get lower and lower until we actually get down here to AN16. This sort of intermediate composition, I think there's probably a fracture that came in and replaced the core. So in fact, this is, this is the oldest part of the plagioclase crystal. This is the youngest part. The discontinuous series, we see this in terms of textures. So here, for example, is a rock that contains olivine, clinopyroxene, and plagioclase. And the olivine forms these isolated crystals, and clinopyroxene grows around it. So here's olivine. Here's clinopyroxene growing around it. And so this is telling us that we are going from a system that was precipitating olivine to a system that was precipitating clinopyroxene. That's going down the discontinuous side of Bowen's reaction series. Here now is a different rock. Here's clinopyroxene that has been overgrown with hornblende. Here's one where we have orthopyroxene overgrown by clinopyroxene. The system goes olivine, orthopyroxene, which you don't always see. Sometimes it goes directly olivine to clinopyroxene. But in many systems, it can be olivine, orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene. So here's our orthopyroxene overgrown by clinopyroxene. And then here's one, clinopyroxene overgrown by hornblende. And then there's a little bit of biotite that's out here as well. So a little bit of biotite towards the very end. Now, one of the things that you do not see is the complete Bowen's reaction series. You can capture certain parts of it, olivine to clinopyroxene, orthopyroxene to clinopyroxene, clinopyroxene to biotite, clinopyroxene to hornblende. You don't get the whole thing, but you get different stages in different rocks. OK, quick question. Which of the following mineral sequences from earliest to latest would be in the correct order for Bowen's reaction series?
and here it would be Hornblende, Biotite, and K. Feldspar. The way I approach this, first of all, I have to remember that the earlier form plagioclase is going to be more calcic, later form plagioclase more sodic. But when I'm thinking about the discontinuous side of Bowen's reaction series, I think in terms of mineral structure, are the silica tetrahedra more connected or less connected? So here I'm going from double chain to sheet to tectosilicate, and so this is the one that's in the correct order. This one, for example, is not because I'm going from a chain silicate to an orthosilicate or island silicate. Okay, so at this point, I hope you have a good sense of how Bowen's reaction series, that it's the evolution of different minerals from less interconnected silica minerals to more interconnected silica minerals. That's the discontinuous side. And then also from more calcic feldspars to more sodic feldspars. And then I would hope that you'd be able to look at textures in a rock to see whether this is evidence for the progression of Bowen's reaction series. All right, thanks.